Now, it's a rather big day for uh, fans of uh, Manchester United. They're waiting to see who'll throw their hat into the ring to buy their club, arguably the biggest brand in global football. The first deadline expires in uh, just a few hours' time. So far, there's only been one public declaration, the British businessman Jim Ratcliffe. But all eyes are now on the Qatari royal family, widely expected to announce their offer. Let's talk to uh, Mark Middling, who's an expert in football finance at Northumbria University. Mark, good to have you. Welcome. Well, tell us a little about the, uh, the main bidders. Well, as you say, uh, Jim Ratcliffe, Britain's richest man, um, is, is, is the one that we know is definitely putting a bid in or has put a bid in. Uh, we also know there's investors linked to the Qatari royal family. And we also um, have heard that there are investors in Saudi Arabia as well. And there might also be some American investors. I've seen one report that Elon Musk might even be an outside bet for, uh, for taking over the famous club. And, uh, Mark, just in case there's anyone watching who has a few dollars down the back of the sofa, um, just give us an idea of the price tag that we're looking at here. And, and frankly, is anyone, anyone going to pay it? Well, I think, firstly, it's going to take a little bit more than a few dollars down the back of the sofa. It's uh, reported to be uh, an asking price of about £5 billion. Pounds. I've seen reports that this could go as high as 6 or £7 billion. Pounds. And I think it's like anything when you sort of get into a bidding war. You know, you know the, the price is what anyone is willing to pay for it. Um, realistically, I think we could see the price going upwards of £6 billion. So we have to ask ourselves, why is Manchester United worth so much? We saw Chelsea sold for, for just over £3 billion with an extra billion pound of investment. So why is, why is Manchester United potentially worth double that? And it comes down to a number of things. Firstly, Manchester United have got a much bigger stadium. They've got about 76,000 seats, which is the second biggest football stadium in England. And that equates to about another million pounds of revenue in uh, ticket sales each match day. They've also got, as you alluded to there, one of the biggest, if not the biggest brands in international football. Manchester United were excellent at being the sort of the first movers in selling themselves to, to the Asian markets, African markets, American markets. So they are you know, globally still today, even though they haven't had a great deal of success in terms of trophies, they are still one of the, the if not the biggest follow club in the world. So the potential to exploit that commercially is greater than it would be at most other clubs. Mark, let's talk about the fans. I mean, they will be delighted, won't they, to see the uh, back of the Glazier family, current owners. What do the fans want from a new owner? I think what they want is the opposite to what they've seen under the Glazers, as you sort of alluded to there. The Glazers have not been popular owners of Manchester City, uh, sorry, of Manchester United. Um, we've even seen a number of fans walk away and start a new football club called uh, uh, football Club United of Manchester, who now play in the lower leagues of the English divisions. Manchester United fans want to see investment in their club. They want to see hope. We've started to see that with Eric Ten Hag um, in charge on the field, but they want to see it off the field too. Um, the Glazers have not invested in the infrastructure of Manchester United. Old Trafford is a, is a stadium in dire need of repair. I've heard reports of parts of the stadium roof leaking on fans. The, the training facilities are also uh, in, in, in need of some in investment too. So what we're seeing here is a club with an infrastructure that's falling behind its main competitors. If we think about Spurs, for example, who have spent you know, the best of a billion pounds on their new stadium. Arsenal have got their shiny new stadium. Manchester City um, benefited from the city of Manchester Stadium. Um, and the legacy of, of, of that. So United uh, have got a... Are, are, they are playing catch-up um, in terms of their infrastructure and their spend around that. Mark, um, as we all check our pockets to see if we can raise $6 billion, um, I mean, is, is owning a football club a vanity purchase? I mean, this is a serious business programme. Is it a legitimately good business, a good business investment? I think we have to look at the individual and at the club that they are purchasing. We've seen um, a history of both. We've seen a history of vanity projects and we've seen a history of, uh, of, of sensible purchases, if you like. Take the, the 
um, local club here, Newcastle United, um, you can't really call Mike Ashley's reign there a a, a vanity project. It was a, it was a very uh, uh, hardline business decision that that Mike Ashley brought Newcastle United. He would have looked at it, seen an undervalued asset, owned that for a period of time, and more than doubled his initial investment in that period. So, it, in some respects, you can look at it as a as a, a, a good business uh, a, a good business decision. That said, you need a lot of luck. Um, Manchester United is one club that stands out from the crowd as being a sensible business proposition and it being, you know, because of the uh, commercial success of the club that I alluded to earlier, um, it does sort of stand apart in being, you know, very commercially successful, which many football clubs aren't. Mark, we're going mm, to leave it there. Necessarily. But thank you so much for talking to us and we'll soon know no Mark Midling from uh, Northumbria University.